Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in today. I am Nicole Forbes with Dennis's 70s. And today we're talking about basic indoor plant troubleshooting and really um, kind of some of the most common houseplant issues. Um, and I don't, <clears throat> uh, you know, because we try to keep things as healthy as possible in a retail setting, I don't have a lot of like great examples of sick plants or yellowing leaves or distressed foliage to show you, but I'm going to do my best um, to describe a lot of these issues. And in most cases, if you're tuning in, you know exactly what these things look like or you know, you're familiar with some of these plant uh, symptoms or um, problems. So we're really kind of talking about yellowing leaves, dropping leaves, discolored leaf tips or leaf edges like brown or black or uh, yellow again, uh, dull leaf color or the, like the uh, colorful leaf that fades to green, weak, spindly, like leggy growth and um, potentially tiny flying bugs, and finally sticky or shiny residue on foliage or on like nearby surfaces. So those are some of our basic symptoms or th things that you would notice as you were working with your plants that would make you look into um, the possible cause or the, so the, you know, the, the source of distress. <clears throat> now to back up, and um, as usual, there is a handout <clears throat> piece, kind of a complimentary content piece that provides a lot of the information that I'll be talking about today. It is a link <clears throat> or a hyperlink that is attached to this video just below the title of the video. If you have any issues accessing that content, just mention it in the comment section and we'll make sure that we link the video or link the handout to you right there directly. If you have other questions, of course, um, or pictures of plant symptoms that we may be able to look at and help you diagnose, also put your questions into the comments and I will be able to answer them uh, after the video or later this afternoon. Now, also linked in the handout are our basic houseplant care tips. So kind of just how to uh, water and about lighting and all of those kinds of things. So basic houseplant care info and also our fall and winter care tips for indoor plants. And that's an important place to start because uh, right now here we are, it's, it's Veterans Day. Um, and again, thanks for, well, not again, thank you for serving if I um, have any veterans in the audience. It's November 11th, so we are well into fall is my point. And so the daylight savings has just occurred for us in, in Oregon. Um, the days are shorter. It's dark by, well, it's getting dark by 4.30 in the afternoon right now. It doesn't get light until, you know, 6 or so in the morning, even 6.30. So that means, of course, we have a short day. Also, the sun has sunk low in the south sky in the southern hemisphere, and it's going to continue to sink even lower as we get into um, true winter. All of that means that our plants inside have registered the change in a, a daylight length <clears throat> and nighttime length, as well as like the angle of the sun. And plants that may have grown well in northern windows, for example, through spring and summer, may now be uh, lacking in light and showing symptoms of low light or possibly over watering because they're in lower light situations. <clears throat> we can move some plants, relocate plants to the southern side of the house or western windows or exposures, or as I will mention again a couple of times today, provide supplemental lighting. And that's artificial grow lights. They are, um, there are so many different types out there now that are energy efficient, LED or cool burning, um, warm lights that you know you also would want to have in your home. This example here is just a simple bulb that can be screwed into any standard outlet 
Ideally, it's uh, like a, a desk lamp or a lamp that can be adjusted in height so that you can find just the right amount of distance from your plant to where the light shines to give it just the right amount of light. <clears throat> but realizing even though they're indoors, even though we run heaters and, you know, think that our house is sort of a climate of its own, our indoor plants realize that it is winter. We do find that a lot of people's plants struggle in the winter months. And so we often are trying to, you know, um, head that off by giving some strong suggestions to reduce watering frequency. So because we have less light and shorter days, plants do not grow as actively or as fast. They're not using the same amount of water at the same rate that they do when they are more actively growing or during spring and summer months. So we begin to cut back on the frequency of watering so that the roots get a chance to get some air or dry out somewhat between those water applications. Uh, we also reduce or uh, stop fertilizing our plants as we go into winter and fall, which um, allows them again to kind of draw off of the reserves that they have provided themselves through the spring and summer months uh, to use what they have. And if we add fertilizer at this time of year, that often can <clears throat> be expressed in uh, like tip browning or fertilizer burn. <clears throat> so some of our very basic care tips are really set up to reduce those very common winter issues such as overwatering, over fertilizing, etc. Now one of the other changes that occurs in our homes from fall and in winter is often the uh, heat that we use to warm our homes whether that's a wood stove or a fireplace or heat vents, whether they come from the ceiling or come from the floor or even a baseboard uh, style heating, heat tends to not only dry out our air, so reduce air humidity, but if you've got a heater and it's blowing enough that you can actually like see the foliage on a plant move when the heat comes on, that's likely too hot of air on that plant and is also going to create a problem. So we'd want to move all of our plants away from like direct heat vent air source and consequently in the summertime from air conditioners as well. So you just don't want um, artificial air, whether it be hot or cold, blowing directly onto the plants. And also keeping them away from uh, drafty doors, doors that are opened and closed constantly. For example, a window that's left open or cracked open, um, that's just creating cold drafts that will, um, for many plants, cause them to uh, be really uncomfortable and, and cause them stress. So reducing drafts and uh, plants that are right up against the window, the window pane, for example, can also get very cold. So paying attention to how close they are to that window glass and pulling the plant just slightly back from the glass if it looks like the foliage that is touching the glass is uh, adversely affected as a result of that. So the point is, again, when you see a yellow leaf, a leaf with a brown tip or distorted shape or discoloring, the first thing we want to ask ourselves is if there's a, a noticeable pattern. Is it at the top? Is it on the side where it's touching the window glass? Is it uh, the foliage down low where maybe it's not getting enough light exposure to it because the top of the plant is big? So looking for patterns is the first thing that's going to help us to determine what may be the cause. It's a little bit of, um, you know, plant investigator that you're going to play and the using all of the available context, you're going to kind of combine those together to understand the scenario. 
And it is a lot easier for you as the caretaker of these plants that you have in your home than it is for somebody who doesn't know, you know, how, how long it's, how long you've had it, how long it's been in the pot that it has, you know, when you last watered it, what kind of light does it get? How cold does your house get at night? You know, all of those questions, you know. So when I look at a plant, I ask myself a lot of different questions like when, when was the last time I watered it? How well, how well does it hold water, I guess, and use the kind of weight of the container. We always suggest to keep them in plastic pots so that you can sort of lift and, and feel the weight of the pot to know if there's a lot of moisture in the soil or not. So this is a very lightweight plant that feels um, quite dry and starts to look a little on the dry side. <clears throat> and then this is actually a pretty heavy pot right now. They're really the same size container. This is a heavy pot and it is a Hoya, which would prefer to be dry. And it's also showing us signs of overwatering. So whereas a fern, which likes to stay moist, is dry feeling and clearly showing some uh, moisture distress or you know being too dry the opposite is the case for this plant and just by feeling the two i can tell wet dry because this is light and this is heavy now asking myself again if i'm looking at a plant just looking and i don't have the weight of the container to give me cues i can look at wet soil I can look at the discolored leaf and in this case I can also see some discoloration on the stem and if I give the leaf a little tug it's probably going to come off pretty easily. Well it's not coming off but it should slowly kind of just come off of the plant. It's also very um, soft and I can actually squeeze some liquid moisture directly out of the leaf. So. Hoya leaves are a little bit succulent in the first place, but this one is extra succulent because it has been overwatered. Now, the last thing that you can do, if you've done all of the kind of above ground, above the soil inspection on a plant like this, is also turn it upside down and take a look at the roots. So I just cover it completely. If I can, lift it out. We have very limited, a minimal root ball. I don't see a lot of roots coiling. I just see a few roots throughout this. And again, the soil is just soaking wet. So we know I can see moisture in the inside of the pot, everything. So a Hoya such as this would very rarely want to be in this type of moist condition. And if it's also in lower light, uh, this is most likely not a plant that's going to recover. So we're looking at root rot, overwatering, uh, pretty much a collapse of the plant cells. And knowing that it is a plant that prefers to stay dry, we know that we've really done this plant in. So done in the Hoya out of overwatering and low light. That is the other side of understanding your plants. Um, you know, you can do all of the inspection above ground, but then also you need to know a little bit about your plant. Um, as I mentioned, Hoyas prefer to stay dry. Ferns would prefer to be uh, more moist and more humid. So if we look at this fern, there's a couple of situations that I took note of, note of as I selected this fern for an example today. One of the situations was that it was sitting in a pot that was deeper. So it was sitting down in a decorative container that was actually too deep for the pot. So it was down a good two, three inches lower than the lip of the container, which means that this whole two inches was below the pot and really in the dark. And now as we see, there are dry, so we have dried up, crispy looking leaves. I can pull quite a few of those out of the inside of the plant. 
So, you know, if we look at the top, the top leaves look pretty healthy. So it's not terribly overwatered. But it, we also see towards the inside some yellowing leaves, center and inside, and more yellowing leaves down here towards the bottom where the plant was really in the dark. So although a fern is tolerant of low light, it can get into too low of light and of course um, start to show symptoms of distress. So as we groom this plant, we can take off the damaged foliage. We can also just snip or pull anything that pulls away, give it a little kind of shake to shake loose anything and look at the roots of this plant <coughs> now fern have totally different roots it's not terribly dry it's not terribly wet it's kind of right in the the happy zone for a fern which means that potentially we could repot this in spring we don't do a lot of repotting this time of year but a little brighter light and a little higher humidity should help keep this fern happy through the winter months <clears throat> so higher humidity could be as simple as just giving it a nice mister spray, but a mister is going to be need, is needing, is, you need to use the mister twice a day at least to really get the plant fully hydrated with extra air humidity. <clears throat> Easier than misting would be to group your plants together, which just kind of happens naturally if you're all trying to kind of congregate plants around the lightest or brightest areas in your home in the winter. So grouping plants together contributes to higher humidity. And then you can use what we call a pebble tray. And a pebble tray is simply a, an, an oversized like cafeteria tray or saucer that <clears throat> has a layer of small rocks or pebbles in it and water that is, uh, the tray is full of water just up to that rock layer. Then plants sit on top of the rock layer and as the water that's in the tray evaporates, it creates a pocket of humidity around plants that increases the moisture available in the air. To um, keep that moisture level, you would just top off the tray as the water evaporates. And you don't want plants to actually be sitting in water for a humidity tray or a pebble tray. So that makes uh, can make a big difference again in our homes when uh, we've got extra dry air. And I always kind of draw the similarity between if I feel that my skin is dry, if I'm going for extra lotion applications, looking for my chapstick, uh, I know that my indoor air is drier than normal, which then has to also, you know, be felt by my plants. So using all of the, using all of the information we can possibly use to determine whether we've got a watering issue, a light sunlight issue, too much or too little, whether we are dealing with a pest or possibly a disease. So really those are kind of your big categories, right? Light, too much or not enough. Water, too much or not enough. Now a subcategory of watering would be what your soil texture or soil, uh, potting soil consistency is. Ferns wouldn't mind a more peaty, rich, moisture-holding mixture, whereas um, our ficus, our monstera, want that fast-draining aeroid mix. So if we've used a potting soil for ferns, for example, for a plant that would prefer something looser and faster draining, we could also be setting ourselves up for watering issues um, and potentially something, you know, down the road, like a root rot when the plant can't get, uh, when the soil doesn't dry out enough in between watering. It is, it is really healthy to have a regular kind of inspection pattern for your indoor plants so that they don't just suddenly come down with something 
that you didn't notice for a long time, allowing that problem to become more significant and um, harder to combat or harder to control. So, uh, you know, every week, every two weeks at the bare minimum, it's really good to get bright light on your plants. And sometimes that means I'm gonna put on um, my little camping headlamp or I use the flashlight on my cell phone to really shine on the plant and give me the best light I can so that I can do some very thorough inspections of the top and the bottom now I'm of the leaves. I'll be looking at the new growth, but also down at some of the oldest leaves to see how healthy they are, if their color is good. And in many cases, again, running the heater in our houses stirs up dust. And then your, the leaves of your plant end up looking kind of dusty. And so a nice wipe or cleaning at the same time as you're doing your inspection will just make sure that you're seeing something that is not dust. If you think you see a pest, you can kind of wipe it away and see if it's wipe awayable or if it stays on there. You could use a little warm water or neem oil at the same time and kind of shine or clean your leaves, which helps them photosynthesize um, and, you know, better process sunlight anyway. So uh, they benefit from that as well. And as you're doing that inspection, you may spot an early sign of something that either, you know, should be watched or uh, something that needs to, you know, have direct action. So we as uh, Dennis Seventies, we're always here to kind of, you know, help troubleshoot for you or with you. We can't always have you bring in a sick plant, of course, to threaten our plants, but photos, um, maybe a leaf, bring us a leaf sample in a plastic bag if you have um, anything that we can kind of take a look at to help diagnose things. Uh, we're always happy to do that. Now, not enough sunlight can cause yellowing leaves. And as I mentioned on a plant like this, that's often going to be lower end on the inside of the plant where it just really can't get enough light. The newest outer growth gets the most brightest light. So that's maintaining. And the plant is just kind of cutting some of its expenses by reducing or, re or kind of letting go of some of the growth in the inside of the plant. Conversely, it is possible for plants to sunburn or to have too bright light. And that tends to be the outer or upper leaves, of course, the ones that are exposed to the light first. And often the leaf surface, rather than being kind of a shiny, healthy texture, may appear dull and kind of lose its luster and sheen. And often a dull colored leaf is a good indication that that plant is in too bright of light or too much direct sun. Very few of our indoor plants uh, are able to handle prolonged direct sunlight on their leaves without burning. So most of them are only accustomed to filtered light that kind of shines in through an upper story of foliage or trees above them. We also, when we have too low of light, so similar to yellowing on the inside of the plant, low light can cause a colorful plant or a variegated plant, something that's green and white or gold and green, to lose its variegation. So the, suddenly it becomes less and less uh, bicolored or showy. And eventually in low light, a <clears throat> pink plant, a silver or you know blue green succulent, for example, will slowly lose that bright coloration and again fade to a green leaf in general. And that is also the plant's best effort to photosynthesize and um, make the most of the limited light that it has. So rather than being variegated, rather than being bluish or pink, it's more likely to get energy from light if it has more chlorophyll, which is why it turns green. We will also see 
plant's response to light by uh, either stretching or bending in the direction of the light source. So it is, um, if you know your plants are a few feet away from a southern window, eventually they're all going to kind of point and look and, and try to get closer to that southern window. So one of the things that is good to do is about every month or so, give a little turn to your plants to rotate and allow different sides of the plant to be exposed to that brighter light or the primary light source. That's going to keep them growing more balanced or symmetrical. <clears throat> if it is too low of light in general and there really isn't a window source, for example, of light, our indoor plants growing in low light will do what's just called stretching. And stretching is just as you could imagine. It gets longer and kind of leggier. In some cases, stretching will uh, result in a floppy plant that needs to be staked up. <clears throat> and the space between the leaves will get longer and longer and longer so that there's lots of stem between sets of leaves as a plant is trying to stretch for brighter light. So uh, those symptoms again can be, we can trim back or pinch back in spring a plant that's stretching and give it brighter light or simply just give it brighter light and um, see how it grows and responds and then maybe do a little trimming or pinching accordingly afterwards. <clears throat> so sunlight and light in general and how plants respond to it <clears throat> is one way. Now, is one uh, general kind of cause and effect. Dropping leaves, just random plants dropping leaves can be a source of distress both for you know the person who takes care of them as well as the plants themselves. Probably one of the best known or most usual suspects for dropping leaves is uh, members of the ficus family and specifically um, the like ficus benjamina, the weeping ficus, ficus triangularis does quite a bit of leaf dropping. Less so the ficus elastica or rubber tree and then the fi audrey ficus here, they don't do quite as much of that like drama drop but most ficus will drop a leaf or some leaves just in response to a change in their environment. And a change in the, their environment is bound to happen when they leave the garden center and go home with you. So <clears throat> expect that the plant will drop some leaves for probably the first two weeks or so as it's readjusting to new light, new humidity and and you so it shouldn't con shouldn't continue beyond two weeks it shouldn't drop all of its leaves it would be a percentage you know maybe one or two a day for the next couple of of weeks but one of the things that we highly suggest as you get a new plant is to make small and incremental changes as you introduce the plant to your home and your lifestyle so that you can identify which change the plant may have disagreed to if things start to um, show signs of stress. So as I mentioned, bringing a new plant home is already a huge change for it. It's left the garden center, it has new light, new air conditions, be it heat or cold or whatever, and you might have just watered it in addition. And maybe you've repotted it and maybe you've trimmed off a few leaves. So now it's got a new environment and new soil and it has been recently watered, but you don't know when it was watered last, all of these things. <clears throat> so small incremental changes would be bringing a new plant home and observing it and simply observing it for the first month or six weeks then potentially making a change to its potting soil, maybe a larger container depending on the time of year. Once you know that the plant is in a spot that it likes uh, environmentally, 
often when we have a plant that's struggling, <coughs> we throw everything that we can think of at it all at once. <coughs> a sick plant, we say, well, we fertilized it, then we repotted it, then we moved it, and then we had a, you know, intervention for it. And, and I'm not sure which one worked or which one it didn't like. Well, who could be sure what happened, you know, which procedure worked or was stressful on the plant when so many things have happened all at once. So again, uh, making those small and incremental changes to observe the effect it has on your plant instead of just to get, you know, like I said, throwing everything at it all at once. So dropping leaves from shock is one thing. Is it new? You know, we ask ourselves, that's where your context comes in. Is this a new plant? Did I just move it from one side of the house to the other? A lot of big floor plants are going to be moved for the Christmas tree. This is something that we do, and it is uh, a fact that most of us are aware of. We don't have just a vacant space to put a big Christmas tree into our homes all the time. There's something there already. And in many cases, it is uh, a big floor plant or something that is living in the you know front living room windows, for example. Now we've got to move that plant aside so we can put our lovely holiday display there in the front windows for everyone to enjoy. And uh, the plant that was there possibly just got put in the dark corner, maybe is sitting on top of or right next to a heat vent or the fireplace. <clears throat> and it's going to sit there for another month or so. So that plant could potentially languish in its new location only to be kind of brought back out after the new year. And after we get rid of our holiday decor and everything, man, do we really want and need some indoor plants to look good and kind of give our house that life again. So that would not be the time a month after moving the ficus or the plant into the corner to then go back and realize, oh, it doesn't look like it really liked what I did to it. So if that's going to happen, again, you're going to move a plant to a dark corner for a month. Go ahead and give it a little shine of a supplemental grow light. Remember to pay attention to where the uh, fireplace or the air vents are for your heater so that it's not getting too much um, warmth or cold air blowing on it or the door, you know, again, drafty doors. It is uh, very common that overwatering can also cause leaf droppage. So on this Hoya that we've been looking at so much, I know it had at least another set of leaves right up here on the stem that have already dropped off. The stem is already starting to kind of shrivel and be, um, well, it's soft. You can see how soft it is, whereas it's, well, yeah, all of it is soft. So we've already lost some leaves further up the stem. Dropping leaves can be a symptom of overwatering. Dropping leaves can also be a symptom of underwatering. And I know that that's just like, well, which one is it? Well, we have to use the context. We know if our plant is wet or if it's dry. If we water it every Monday or if we can't remember the last time we watered it, we should know those things. And so using again that context, is it soaking wet and dropping leaves, then that's overwatering and likely now into a root rot scenario. Is it bone dry? In fact, I can pour water over top and the water just drains through and runs out the bottom, then it's not getting hydrated enough. When you have a plant that has gone so dry that the soil has pulled away from the edges of the container, it can become so hard and compacted that it is reluctant to rehydrate. A lot of peat-based soil, peat moss-based soil, can go to the point where it becomes what we call hydrophobic. It practically repels water, whereas um, well-hydrated peat holds a lot of moisture. 
So if you notice you're watering, the water just pouring off and draining out and the plant not getting hydrated, a couple of things that you can do that do not put you into the need to repot at this time of year, because we don't necessarily want to repot during these winter dormant months either. Aeration, poking simple vertical holes with a chopstick, a pencil, whatever small stick you might have. Feel if you hit a root as you're kind of pushing down them, just move it over and push down somewhere else. You don't want to puncture roots, but uh, by aerating the soil, you're going to open up spaces for water to kind of be absorbed so that it doesn't just run off of the crusty top and down the sides. Aeration is one way. Second way is to actually um, submerge your plant or to set it down in a saucer with an inch or two of water in the, in the bottom of the saucer and let it sit there for even an hour or more. What, the way that you'll know if it's starting to absorb water is if you lift it up out of that little wet saucer and it's feeling heavier or, and usually you can see that the amount of water in the saucer is beginning to um, decrease, that, that that's exactly what's happening. The plant is drinking it up. <clears throat> Rehydrating this way can help quite a bit. And you may also use, again, the context of whether or not your plant has a layer of mulch, for example, over top of it or not. Now, I know you're like, well, mulch, I, you know, mulch my garden, but I don't mulch my house plants. Well, that's not exactly true. A lot of people use uh, decorative moss, green moss or sphagnum moss or Spanish moss as a, you know, covering over top of the soil as the plants sit in our homes. And that layer of moss over top of the plant soil actually acts as mulch. So if you pull that layer of moss away, you'll notice that the soil underneath is usually on the moist side as opposed to very dry and certainly going to be wetter than a plant that is equivalent in size and exposure that doesn't have that moss layer on top. So that moss layer is going to um, stretch your frequency of watering even further than a plant that doesn't have that layer on top. So using again all of those things to kind of help you understand why the leaves are dropping or why the leaves are yellow and occasionally again dropping leaves can be an indication of pests but often that's a little bit further down the line and you probably would have noticed some of these other symptoms sooner. Now discolored, just uh, like leaf edges browning or blackening, yellow curling leaves or edges that are either curling up or curling down. Often this is a sign of lack of humidity <clears throat> and lack of humidity. This uh, is a perfect example of a plant that loves humidity. This is a stromanthe and we can see, well, so we see leaf tips with kind of crispy, damaged uh, bottoms. This one actually has, we can start to see edge of the leaf is brown and discolored as well as the tip itself. The new growth, this is maybe its newest leaf. The new growth is probably the best looking and the healthiest of all of the foliage and the lowest growth is showing the most damage. So the curling, yellowing, even some brown edges and tips on the bottom leaves, we don't quite see that kind of stuff up high. So that tells us a little bit about potentially overwatering on this. Now we're in a peat, a very peat based soil. Uh, I can see some cocoa fiber as well, but looks kind of high. The soil's uh, mounded up over the top here and the plant feels pretty heavy. We also see, oh, there's some brown uh, discolored plant material that really is just pulling away from the base. 
So I have a feeling we've let this plant get a little too wet more than once. Some of this is just kind of rotting away at the bottom. <clears throat> and what stromanthi really like is high humidity. So this plant is in the uh, same family as prayer plants, same family as calathea, and is one of the plants that would prefer to sit in a pebble tray or to be misted on a regular basis. But remember that misting can also lead to foliage diseases and problems if you don't give the plant a chance to kind of dry out in between. So ideally you're misting in early part of the day and even by midday and then allowing your plant many hours to dry out before it goes into the dark time. On, <clears throat> on a plant such as this, I would expect or kind of especially in the winter time, unless I have extreme humidity in my home, I would expect to see a little bit of these tip uh, burns, unless I can add a humidifier, unless I can create that pebble tray environment for it. Even in our bathrooms or kitchens where we consider it a higher humidity environment, even in those conditions, um, we often see you know, that it's just not enough for a plant. So we think that it's humid in there. It feels humid to us, but not necessarily when, um, you know, taken from the plant's perspective. Now, distorted misshapen leaves. <clears throat> Here's a good example. So I've got a little Mikan's philodendron here, and we see some leaves that have gotten really thin, so paper thin, they've lost their color. They're sort of a pinky color instead. Now new growth is often that beautiful pink coloration, but it's a little bit stiffer and sturdier. And these discolored leaves, well, again, where this plant was, and even just how you see its growth is, it's all growing out from one direction. It's all headed to one side. And this side of the plant looks very sad. And that's also where we see the discoloration. Now I happen to know that this plant was growing on a shelf. A lot of us grow plants like this on a shelf. I mean, it's a trailing plant, it's perfect for a shelf, but it was on a shelf where it was literally in the dark for the back half. So the back half of this plant was not exposed to sunlight or artificial light. And now the back section is kind of just dying off because of that lack of light exposure. So we see this discoloration, we pull these leaves off. I can see new growth starting down here. So we haven't done permanent damage. In fact, if I turned this plant or gave it light on the backside, we would see all kinds of growth respond because we haven't overwatered it, we haven't damaged the roots, and there isn't actually a pest. So lighting, as long as again, you can kind of catch it early, lighting can, uh, conditions can be corrected or enhanced. And again, you can get yourself out of a problem uh, pretty quickly. Sometimes leaves are just old. And that is, uh, you know, that is part of the kind of care and grooming process in general is that not every leaf can last forever and especially old lower leaves they have been with the plant for a long time they may have served their function they may now be low down and not able to photosynthesize well so they kind of just can't be as useful to the plant and maybe they're costing more energy than they can return so often a plant will take a low old leaf and reabsorb the available nutrients in the leaf to send those nutrients further up the plant, kind of recycling to the newer, younger generation. And as a result, that leaf begins to yellow and slowly it will even just uh, fall off or we usually are gonna come along and remove it. So in nature that would fall on the ground continue to decompose and add a little bit of natural fertilizer 
back to the plant, but we are, you know, pulling it away. So that's why we have to fertilize. <clears throat> now, distorted, misshapen, spotty, or kind of unusual growth I could have multiple causes, as you'll see, you know, as all of these kind of things do. So we have to go into context and then inspection. So we've got another piece of uh, philodendron micans here. And this one you can see has, I don't even know if you can see on camera. It's just sort of a spotty leaf. It's not the right color or texture. And if you look at it in light or against light, you can actually really see some of the spots or speckles on the plant. So sometimes it's all about like, does it have a halo? Uh, what can you see in bright light? What do the spots look like? And if I put a bright flashlight on this plant and looked closely at it, I start to see little, little white things, which of course makes me go, uh-oh, I need to look closer. Get your magnifying glass. This is a little jeweler's loop, which I use, um, fits in my pocket. But, you know, you have a magnifying glass at home. Most of us do. And then I'm going to look in even more detail closer up on the plant to try to figure out what I see. And in this case, I can see tiny, tiny white dots, tan dots, very, very, very fine webbing, really fine webbing. I'm not, not talking about spider's webs or Charlotte's web. It's sort of just almost dust webbing. And both of those things combined give me the information to tell me that I'm probably dealing with spider mites on this plant. So then I'm going to look at the rest of the plant in more better light and more detail. The first thing when you have a pest issue is to isolate. So take that plant away from other plants so that it can so that it can't potentially spread its pest to other plants. Once it's isolated, you can again begin treatment for spider mites. Now spider mites is not an easy uh, pest to eradicate, but you can do it with a constant, you know, kind of consistency and vigilance. A lot of products work on mites. So uh, this is eight, which is basically sulfur and pyrethrins. Insecticidal soap also works on spider mites and a product that is very specific to spider mites called Mite X. Now Mite X is botanical extracts like clove oil, cinnamon oil, garlic oil, cottonseed oil. So it kind of smells like salad dressing or something like that while you're working with it. But any of these products need to be thoroughly coated onto the top and the bottom of the leaf surface like to dripping and in in like the oil case it's also um, potentially going to stain things so i like to put my my plants in like a plastic bag or a garbage sack and then spray or treat them so that they can drip uh in in a place that's not on my carpet or on my table or anything now, if it's not, you know, so spider mites, a decent example of spider mites. Sometimes you see a plant where the foliage just kind of has a weird shine to it that shouldn't. Or maybe you touch it and it feels a little sticky. Or even like if this were our ficus sitting on the table, for example, you might actually notice that the table below the plant has a shiny or a sticky substance on it. That is an indication that there's a pest on the plant that needs to be um, located with, you know, further careful inspection. So again, I see something sticky or shiny. I'm going to get out a bright light, flashlight, my phone light. I'm going to start looking closely at the plant tops and bottoms of the leaves, even along the stem for potentially mealybug. And mealybugs can look like little white sort of bits of fuzz, for example. 
mealybugs like to sit right kind of at the rib, either the midrib of the plant or right where the stem and the leaf join together, either on the top or the bottom, but white and sort of cottony. So if you poke at it, you know, try to poke it with a pencil or something, you'll see a little bit of fuzzy white cotton come away. If it's not the fuzzy white, it may be scale, which is another insect that we commonly see on houseplants, and ficus is one that can get scale. Scale is gonna be a little tan or uh, light colored, almost like scab. In some cases, it's a bump, but you can um, scratch it off with a fingernail or again, like a pencil, and see sometimes a little discolored surface underneath the leaf where the where the scale bug was scale don't move around a lot uh, with the exception of when they are in kind of their larval stage but they can also be very difficult to kill or control because they have like a an armor plating over top of them that helps to keep them uh, safe from like a lot of chemical sprays and things so one of the best products to use against scale is an oil or oil-based product. Neem oil is one of those that many of us have kind of in our houseplant care kit because neem oil is uh, a very effective miticide. So that works on the spider mites that we were just talking about. It's a basic insecticide. So it works on a lot of insects as a smothering technique mostly so it just kind of coats the outside of the insect and, and uh, suffocates them and then neem oil also works as a fungicide best as more preventative or for mild cases of fungal problems but this is one of those that could be used as a leaf shine or as even preventative treatment of plants especially those prone to pests and diseases and the way neem oil gets used, if you're not just doing like an overall spray on a plant, you can get a soft, just a soft rag, a cloth. Sometimes they use the sock that comes out like all by itself in the laundry and there's no match. Uh, that is a perfect little kind of plant cleaning mitt. You can put your little hand into it, spray it with the neem oil. Again, remember, it's oily, so uh, watch what your overspray is on. Uh, and neem oil doesn't smell. I mean, it has an odor that's not super great. It's not horrible. It's not going to chase you out of the house, but you might want to crack a window or two um, if you're doing a lot of neem oil work. And then just using it as a cleaning material to just dust off your great big leaf surface like these rubber trees. They just absorb dust. They hold on to dust in the house and they look so much better when they're clean. So not only are we cleaning it, but we're doing a preventative pest wipe at the same time. Get the bottoms and the tops. Sometimes two socks is great because you can hold one and kind of work with the other. <clears throat> but the idea is that this is maybe a monthly activity or as needed or only on plants that you just know tend to be either prone to pests or in an area that puts them into a little bit more stress. Now, you're fine, you're fine. <clears throat> a plant that is prone to pests is another uh, kind of direction to go. So the more you learn about the plants that you have, the more you also learn some of their like basic either quirks or endearing qualities, however you want to look at it, we know um, or we learn their faults and their tendencies. It's just like getting to know a human being. The things that make them great and the things that drive you crazy. And in some cases you learn to live with them and in other cases you learn to live without them. Palm trees all types of palms. This is a Kentia palm, for example, uh, but uh, bamboo palms and parlor palms and you know, you name it, palm trees thrive with humidity. So they usually are growing in areas where there is a high moisture content in the air. <clears throat> we do often see tip burning or browning on the 
ends of palm fronds because they're growing in air that's too dry. So again, that's one of the first things that we know. Palms love humidity. They're gonna grow in an area where, or in my home, where I have high humidity, or better, given a humidifier grouped with other plants or um, you know, regularly misted. Now also, just knowing, just using palm as an example, Palms have a few pests that they are the more likely to have than others. Number one pest for palms are spider mites. So knowing that that is what we need to be looking for when we're doing our inspection every month or every couple of weeks, we can work on preventative. So spray it just in case every so often, keep the leaves clean, and be watching for that telltale sign, that sort of dotted, stippled look of the spider mite that we saw on the philodendron. So knowing the plant and knowing its tendencies can give us a place to start instead of just like, I don't know, is it too much water? Not enough water. Are you sick? Do you have a disease? Didn't you like the food I gave you? I can say, palm, what's our humidity, humidity level? check for spider mites. First two things I'm gonna do, and if I have not found the problem, then I'm gonna kind of continue down the line, further inspecting, checking the roots, asking when I last watered it, all those types of things. Now, I will tell you that because I have a, a, a decent sized houseplant collection, um, somebody the other day was telling me they had like 55 houseplants, and I counted the ones in my bathroom and I have like 40 houseplants in my bathroom. Um, so when you have a lot of plants, you need to have a pretty regular understanding of um, kind of give and take of the seasons, a regular inspection and treatment kind of pro plan or program. And if you find that you've got a problem, uh, you need to intervene quickly. And so, like I said, isolate, probably uh, the best tool that you can figure, that you can use until you figured out what's wrong. In some cases, you will need to go to a systemic houseplant uh, insecticide. So if you're dealing with something that is very hard to treat through spray, such as scale, such as thrips, which are so tiny, uh, thrips can often get down kind of inside the plant tissue, down in the, in the crevices between the stem and the leaf to the point where it's very hard to spray them. Uh, you may need to go to a systemic insecticide and systemic such as this are applied to the soil and kind of taken up inside the plant for longer protection. This is 30 days, I believe, um, Oh no, eight weeks, so quite a long time on the systemic houseplant insect control here. It's um, only for use in potted plants, and this is specifically in the house. So aphids, whiteflies, mealybugs, scale, thrips, um, a lot of insects can be controlled on the, with the systemic. The last thing that happens when you have a lot of houseplants, and potentially... Uh, as you may be overwatering, is that you will find little tiny flying insects either near your potted plants or what I often find is um, they're in my morning coffee or in my glass of wine. They're smaller than a fruit fly but kind of similar in um, size. Usually they're black instead of brown. These are fungus gnats, and fungus gnats are associated with uh, overwatering or potting soil that's kept too moist. Plants that have, um, that are growing in containers with no drainage are often going to become um, infested with fungus gnats over time. Fungus gnats are, they themselves can, the larva can eat roots of the plant to start uh, dis causing distress in the plant but it's more again of an indication that the soil is too wet 
and too consistently wet, not allowed to dry out in between. So now there's a fungus growing in the soil. Fungus gnats will slowly and can slowly weaken and kill a plant, but root rot will do it first. So um, when you see fungus gnats, it's just a matter of time before you see further signs of distress, usually on a plant because of overwatering. So immediately starting to try to dry up the plant. Um, I have even, believe it, I know that this sounds funny, but I have taken a plant that's overwatered. I have made little holes in the soil and actually put a tampon, a dry tampon, unused tampon, right down into the soil. Maxi pad on the top might work too and let that tampon absorb up water and then gotten rid of it. And that, you know, if you're trying to dry up a plant to save its life, um, you're, you probably do weirder things than that. So um, if you've got any of those types of supplies on hand, it's worth a try. Really one of the last resorts would be trying to repot a plant that is already potentially in root rot. So um, repotting is like, pretty stressful on a plant in the first place. So repotting a sick plant in the off season to do it is also a setup for um, added stress, not, you know, a road to recovery necessarily. So um, just make sure that you are taking the, you know, the first step before you take the most drastic step. Um, and, and always, you know, if you have questions, you can ask us, we're happy to help kind of troubleshoot or problem solve with you. If you have fungus gnats and you can get your plant to dry out a bit, you may want to go immediately after those gnats as well. So dealing with the overwatering issue is one thing, but now you have these little bugs flying around in your house. Mosquito bits, which is a bacteria that kills mosquito larvae in standing water, also is effective in killing fungus gnats in your potting soil. It is um, best used kind of sprinkled over the soil surface and then allowed to kind of water in. I do know it can also be added to water, um, kind of pull out the solution and then use that the next time you water your house plants. It's um, non-toxic unless you're a, a mosquito larva or a fungus gnat, of course. But in most cases, you're already dealing with an overwatered plant. So you have to wait until the next time it's ready to be watered to use something such as this. There are um, a lot of other, you know, again, a lot of other kind of symptoms that we can go into, but it all relates back to, as I keep saying, sunlight, too much, not enough, water, too much, not enough, too frequent, too infrequent. These things then, humidity, as I mentioned, air temperature, but these things can lead to stress and a stressed plant is more likely then to come down with pests or diseases. It's um, really easy to start with some of the products that we've just talked about today, both on a maintenance and kind of um, beneficial monthly schedule. It's also, I highly recommend keeping a houseplant journal so if that is something, if you love to journal, um, just add a houseplant journal to kind of your process. But if you're not a big journaler, but you love your houseplants, this could be a place for you to just start making a record, whether it's on paper, digitally. My houseplant journal is like, when I got the plant, what size was it? What is the plant? And then anytime I do something significant with or to the plant, I just note it in the journal. So if I've relocated it, repotted it, changed its soil, discovered it had a pest, those are mostly the things that I take. Oh, fertilize, those are all things that I take note of and jot down in my houseplant journal. And that gives me the chance, because I have quite a few, to remember what I did and go back and use that as just a little bit extra context to help me figure out, should I water it again? Is it ready to be treated again, um, et cetera. So with that being said, you have specific examples, uh, leaf pictures, questions that we can answer in the comments section. Please do include those. 
everyone will surely benefit from the conversation uh, that extends beyond the topic uh, from the class video today. I genuinely appreciate you watching and as always, happy gardening.